Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if I should still wait for a few more seconds on my uh, clock. It's 2 p.m. in the afternoon Geneva time. And I'll just wait for one more minute. Okay. Welcome. <clears throat> My name is uh, Stefan Schmolt. I am a cash technical advisor with the International Rescue Committee and one of the co-chairs of the Global Protection uh, Clusters Cash for Protection Task Team. I welcome you all to the webinar Cash for Protection Task Team and Integration of GBV Risk Mitigation in Cash, which is part of the uh, GPC's Global Protection Forum 2020. We are very excited um, to have seen also uh, already in, in, in the um, run up to this event, um, so much interest in this event, and we'll give our best to ensure that you will leave this webinar with um, new and useful information for your work. Um, I wanna start just with the, the usual uh, few notes on housekeeping. Um, everyone on here is, is on mute unless they are a speaker. Um, we, we hope that you understand that. Um, please use the chat box, however, for any questions or comments throughout the webinar. We allocated uh, towards the end of, of the session of the webinar quite some time for Q&A. So there will be a uh, space for that. Um, this session will be recorded and later uploaded uh, onto the GPC uh, website. Um, I hope that um, everyone now had the time to, to join. And without further ado, I'm handing over uh, to Jennifer Chase, the global uh, GBV AOR coordinator, who is also representing the GPA, GPC on this webinar, to share a few opening uh, remarks. Um, over to you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy that you joined this webinar. I think we're going to really learn a lot, um, not just from the panels, but from each other. And so I look forward to the discussion and the Q&A. Um, so, we know that the cash voucher assistance can contribute to protection objectives, um, GBV prevention and response, child protection, access to healthcare and other services, while also putting decision-making power in women's hands. Um, and these are the positive sides and, and the task team leads will discuss the stock taking on cash for protection programming um, as we move ahead. However, in the GBV AOR and the other AORs, as well as the GPC, we recognize that there is still work to be done on ensuring that protection and specifically gender and GBV risk analysis informs the design, implementation, and monitoring of couch, cash and voucher assistance. The GBV AOR, which is led by UNFPA, is rolling out guidance and support for GBV coordination groups in the field with concrete actions they can take to ensure GBV risk mitigation in cash and voucher assistance programming, working closely with the existing cash working groups, and that's at all levels. We must continue to bridge the protection and the cash voucher assistance communities to ensure that all CVA reaches those furthest behind, especially as it grows in scale and scope. And we know that cash was one of the issues that was discussed in the grand bargain, and we need to make sure that we roll it out in a way that is responsible and does no harm. And I am going to turn it back to Stephen um, for the rest of the discussions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I, however, will uh, hand over uh, directly to Barbara Weiermann uh, from the Swiss Agency for Development and, uh, and Cooperation. Uh, Barbara is the SEC's Gender and SGBV uh, Advisor for Humanitarian Aid, who also agreed to share a few open remarks. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much. And I would like to welcome all participants on behalf of SDC. And thank you for the opportunity to make some opening remarks. SDC strongly advocates for the increased use of cash and voucher assistance whenever it is the best approach to meet people's needs 
while at the same time stressing the centrality of protection and the importance of doing no harm. SDC has been an early adopter of cash and voucher assistance, implementing its first cash projects in the 1990s in the Balkans. Ever since then, SDC has been a strong advocate for CDA. So, we have, for example, we implemented around directly around 30 projects in the last 24 years. And we have been supporting partner organizations through the continents. Partners such as WFP, UNHCR, UNICEF, ICRC and IFRC. We are advocating for the increased uptake of CVA in global discussions through the Grand Bargain Cash Work Stream and as a part of the uh, Global Cash Forum. And finally, as a donor, Switzerland is providing financial support to partners engaged in CBA. Um, SDC welcomes the combined efforts of partners coming together under the Global Protection Clusters Cash for Protection Task Team to better understand how different modalities can influence protection outcomes in humanitarian settings. The stock taking paper brings together evidence gathered by members of the areas of responsibility on GBV and child protection and puts forward key recommendations for humanitarian stakeholders on how to use CBA to support protection outcomes. We look forward to building on these findings in today's discussion. While learning from the field suggests that CBA can support protection outcomes for women and girls if well designed and part of a comprehensive services, including case management, evidence also shows that a lack of GBV risk analysis and CVA programs can lead to stigma, tension, or even violence against women who receive cash. SBC is thus actively supporting the efforts of UNFPA and the GBV AOR to ensure that protection risk analysis informs CVA design, implementation, and monitoring across all sectors. To this end, SDC is seconding a roving expert to UNFPA for 2020 and 2021. Today, we welcome the opportunity to hear case snapshots from field operations of both protection on, and GBV risk mitigation and CVA, and of CVA and GBV response. I look forward to the opportunity to reflect together with you on learnings and on promising practices in CVA and protection. Thank you very much. I look forward to a very interesting uh, webinar and with this, hand it back to you, Stefan. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I will now just uh, proceed very briefly to uh, present the agenda. So as you can see here on the slide, um, we will have uh, the first uh, section will be the, the presentation of the cash and protection, cash for protection task team and the stock taking paper on cash and protection, which was uh, already mentioned. Um, and uh, we will also pr share the pre-survey -resu pre results that some of you have um, uh, kindly um, completed. In the second um, section, we will um, talk a little bit of, about a few tools that are coming up uh, or coming out uh, soon. And uh, we'll have a very uh, mini training on uh, GBV risk analysis. The second um, session will be uh, led by Jonah Friedman um, from UNFPA together with uh, Christine Heckman from UNICEF. And the third part of this webinar will focus on best practices and lessons learned from the field. Here we will hear from CARE, from IRC, from UNFPA, uh, from Empowerment Aid, and from UNHCR. And um, then, as I already mentioned before, uh, there will be a, a larger session um, if we don't um, um, lose too much time on the way uh, for um, Q and A. So please um, keep your um, questions either until then or um, even better mention them already in, in the chat box because we will try to organize the questions and group them uh, according, um, accordingly into groups. Okay, um, now I will start <clears throat> to move into, um, to share firstly the uh, pre survey results with you. As you uh, can see on the slide, um, to the questions, have you used cash or vouchers before in protection program to support protection outcomes? Um, 
uh, the majority of the people who uh, did um, fill out the survey in, 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 uh, in advance said yes. Um, not so many said, uh, said uh, no, and, and very few were not really sure. But also uh, shows us that um, there is some, some room, room to, um, with potentially training. That's also one of the things that we identified in the um, stock taking paper to, um, to improve that situation. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Um, the second um, question was, do you feel equipped with knowledge, skills, and tools to use cash and vouchers in protection programming? And here um, we can see that, uh, let me just get, go into the details. We can see that 45% um, uh, feel somewhat, somewhat familiar um, with those, uh, with the knowledge and skills and tools to use cash and voucher per, um, um, assistance for uh, protection outcomes. And 22.5% uh, each feel very familiar or not so familiar. And again, 5% uh, feel, feel extremely familiar or not at all familiar with that. Um, I think those, those numbers are also speaking uh, more or less for themselves. And uh, please, the, the next slide, yes, exactly. The, uh, the last question of the pre-survey, uh, uh, pre-session survey was if, if no, if you do not feel um, that you are um, yet ready to, to uh, use CVA for protection outcomes, what are the barriers uh, to you gaining the knowledge, the skills and the tools? And here um, I have uh, copied out a few quotes, but then also grouped a few things. So here, um, one was an opportunity to, to learn and implement um, just materialized now. So there are, I interpret this as, as things are coming out, but I haven't been able to use them yet. Um, context anal analysis is still needed to know what could be uh, most impactful, um, which is also uh, interesting because it is in line with uh, what we have um, found in, in the stock taking paper. Uh, some respondents uh, don't work on protection um, or protection outcomes or they, they lack protection or also CVA understanding. Um, a few find, uh, had, had, a, had just a trouble to find the time to go through the existing materials and resources. And um, I cannot see this slide right now. Um, let's go into my own slides. Sorry for that. Ah, now I can see. Um, <clears throat> the effectiveness of, uh, um, of cash and beneficiary selection process is, is still unclear to some. Um, also here, I, I guess we're talking uh, about mostly uh, things that, we, that could uh, potentially be resolved with um, a capacity building. So all in all, we found that um, from that uh, pre-survey result that um, a lot of uh, capacity building is needed, but then uh, there was also a lot of uh, comments that exactly said that without me interpreting. So basically, I'm now moving on uh, to the, um, to present the task team on, on cash for protection. Um, so give you a broad overview for those who, who don't know it, uh, that well. So um, the Global Protection Clusters Task Team on Cash for Protection was established in uh, 2017 to increase the knowledge about the use of CVA in the protection sector, as well as the effectiveness and quality of programs using CVA to achieve protection outcomes. It is currently chaired by each one representative uh, of the Women's Refugee Commission and the International Rescue Committee. It is open to any organization, agency, or cluster that would like to participate, so the more the merrier. Uh, currently, we have a uh, task team membership of, of more than uh, 30 organizations. The task team is, is doing pioneering work in, in a sense, uh, given the large gaps in evidence and, um, and implementation. We know, if you will, also through the stock taking paper now, where there, are, uh, where there is great potential, but we have to work on identifying and scaling best practice. The next uh, slide, please. Um, the work plan of the um, cash and, and for protection task team is centered around the following object objectives. So number one, strengthening uh, the coordination on cash for protection. Uh, two, map, generate, and disseminate evidence on cash for protection to address critical gaps. 
Three, support stakeholder capacity building on cash for protection. And four, mobilize resources to support the activities of the, cash, uh, of the task team and its work plan. The next slide, please. Um, we, the, the task team, have uh, just launched the, the stock taking paper on cash and voucher assistance for protection, which focuses on uh, um, cash and voucher assistance for protection outcomes in the protection sector. It, this, this stock taking paper uh, was a collaborative uh, effort among task team members. Uh, we had around 40 individu individuals across uh, 30 agencies working on it. And it is um, sort of the fund foundational uh, to the stock taking paper where the evidence uh, mappings develop jointly or individually by, this, uh, by different uh, task team members. So the current stock taking paper that we have right now addresses the cash and voucher assistance for child protection and gender-based violence outcomes. And we plan future editions, which will then also reflect the evidence on CVA for housing, land and property outcomes, as well as mine action outcomes. The next slide, please. So the key lessons <clears throat> that we found here, um, uh, firstly, the, 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 the study, um, the, the, the stock taking paper confirmed that cash and voucher assistance has the potential to contribute to positive protection outcomes. The evidence suggests that um, CVA alone is unlikely to achieve meaningful long-term protection outcomes unless integrated into a holistic and cross-sectoral programming um, that includes case management and referral systems. For example, a cash transfer delivered through uh, case management might help address aspects of gender-based violence, uh, specifically when core GBV response services such as legal services or health uh, services are not accessible due to financial barriers. So therefore, uh, cash can be considered instrumental to a survivor's recovery. Another note on GBV, um, the persistence of poor um, practice, uh, so we're talking about mostly poor coordination between cash and GBV practitioners, or the failure to integrate cash and GBV programming, um, or the failure to conduct ongoing gender and protection analysis. All these things undercut the potential of CVA contributing to, to GBV outcomes. On the child protection side, um, where we saw uh, mostly uh, limitations on the supply side. So school facilities, qualified teachers, and those are crucial to require a multi-faced, um, multi-facet and coordinated approach. The next slide, please. In terms of critical gaps, um, while protection cash or cash for protection or the use of cash and voucher assistance to help achieve uh, protection outcomes, all these terms are increasingly used by humanitarian practitioners, but there's still a lack of common understanding around these concepts and an absence of common policy and uh, operational framework. Um, also, we found efforts are still needed to understand which forms of CVA, conditional, unconditional, restricted, unrestricted, and which ways of delivering cash or vouchers, for example, ATM cards, mobile money, cash in hand, are best suited for which type of protection uh, programming. This uh, relates to obviously project design. Uh, moreover, we need to understand um, better the, necess the necessary complementary protection services to reach longer term protection outcomes. Also here we're talking about uh, project design. On the GBV side, we have yet to find out what are the impacts of CVA for the most uh, excluded and marginalized groups of GBV uh, survivors and individuals at risk, including women with disabilities, older women, married and unmarried uh, adolescent, adolescents, uh, girls, and persons with diverse uh, sexual orientation and gender identities. For child protection, uh, comp comparative evaluations are needed um, or still needed to learn across CVA modalities and contexts if conditions tied to CVA for caregivers, for example, can have a significant impact on the well-being of children. So uh, the last slide um, here on the stock taking paper um, deal with the recommended uh, actions. So we recommend breaking down silos between CVA and protection actors through mutual capacity building and improved coordination on CVA and protection. The protection sector should proactively reach out to other sectors, including, for example, cash working groups where they exist in country to initiate and maintain ongoing dialogue through local, national and international fora. Secondly, um, we we um, propose to invest in capacity strengthening of humanitarian staff to leverage CVA for protection outcomes, 
and meaningfully prioritize and center local partners' uh, capacities to support also uh, CVA um, for protection and, and, and thereby also realize the uh, localiz localization agenda of the drain park. Thirdly, uh, use existing um, yet limited guidance that there are that is out there already in tools and align uh, it to the processes of your respective uh, organization. Fourth, develop clear eligibility criteria and harmonize targeting and implementation approaches for cash, uh, of cash uh, for protection activities at the country and at the sector levels. Number five, share, publish, and disseminate lessons learned uh, from integrating uh, CVA into standalone protection programming. Number six, in order to fund cash for protection programming, obviously protect, uh, practitioners need to include cash for protection within donor proposals based on uh, context specific assessments. And donors uh, on their side also need to res resource uh, CVA for protection outcomes and protection programming, and also the related uh, startup costs, additional staffing, capacity building, et cetera. All that can support the institutionalization um, as a standard aspect of humanitarian response. So standard uh, meaning uh, standardization of cash within um, protection program. And number seven, conducting more research on CVA for protection outcomes and protection risks. We need rigorous, ethical, longer term evidence that adheres to the principle of do no harm, which is particularly lacking in, in conflict settings because uh, the gaps of, of, uh, of knowledge are still vast. Okay, <clears throat> so that um, was my part. Um, if you could now go to the um, to the chat, there we were posting a link now to a quick poll. We invite you to complete. It's a very short one, so please complete it now, and I will present the results immediately uh, after you finalized it. I will just wait for one or two minutes. and then presented. Okay, I hope that everyone's coming to an end. Just a few more seconds. Okay, um, just waiting. We're closing it now. I'm just waiting for the re results. Please bear with me. So amongst us, so uh, what is your cur current role or how, what, what best describes your current role? Um, we can, uh, found that most of us are headquarters-based advisors. So that's 44%, uh, followed by protection specialists with uh, 15%, um, GB visa specialists, no, sorry, uh, cash and, and, and CVA speci specialists, such as myself, uh, with 13%, and then GBV specialists with 9%, protection coordinators with 11% and then GBV coordinators. The second question, if you are a protection or GBV coordination uh, coordinator or specialist, uh, do you ever give advice input on GBV programming such as GBV risk uh, mitigation? Um, 
almost 50% said yes, but interestingly also 43.6% uh, said um, not applicable and 6.8% said no. And lastly, if you are a cash CVA specialist in the field, do you work with protection or GBV colleagues on risk mitigation? Um, interestingly here, we have 72% uh, who said not applicable and 22.8% who said yes. Uh, other, all the others said no. Mm -hmm. I think that, that is, um, it's a bit surprising uh, to myself, to be honest, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, now we're moving on to the second part of the agenda. Um, so the, um, the tools and the mini training GBV risk analysis. And for that, I'm handing over to uh, Joanna Friedman from uh, UNFPA. Thank you, Stefan. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see so many folks on the line today. And I guess it will be my job to tell you that you are, you are all responsible for GBV risk mitigation and cash and voucher assistance, so based on that poll. Um, but first, we wanted to introduce a few pieces of guidance that have come out recently uh, that some of you may be familiar with. And I will also uh, hand over to um, a, our colleague from UNICEF as well to mention some UNICEF guidance, which is forthcoming. Uh, but first, we wanted to mention the cash and voucher assistance and GBV compendium which is a companion guide to the IASC GBV guidelines, which is available on the CALP website and on the GBV AOR website. And we also have released last week uh, by GBV AOR and UNFPA, uh, guidance specifically for GBV coordinators on your role in advising on risk mitigation, GBV risk mitigation in CVA. And this could also be useful for protection coordinators, for GBV and protection specialists, and, and also for CVA experts um, who are looking at uh, the integration of GBV risk mitigation in cash. So it is a shorter guide uh, compared to the overall compendium and very specific for coordinators in terms of what they can do uh, working with cash working groups in particular. And now I'd like to ask uh, my colleague Christine Heckman from UNICEF to, um, to speak uh, about some forthcoming UNICEF guidance as well. Thanks, Joanna, and hi, everyone. My name is Christine Heckman. I work with the Gender-Based Violence and Emergencies team for UNICEF. Um, we just wanted to take the opportunity to flag that um, UNICEF uses cash as a modality across pretty much all of our sectors. Um, and so our emergency operations team is in the process of developing guidance for all of those programmatic sectors, so health and education um, and other various guides. Um, and so we thought that the most relevant for this group just to put on your radar is that there, there is um, guidance that's ready but not yet public for both child protection and GBV. And um, they both of those notes build upon interagency resources that are all, already available, but are really about sort of institutionalizing and socializing um, those resources to the UNICEF specific systems. So the child protection one is really focused on how cash can target risks and vulnerabilities for child protection issues. So thinking about things like child labor, family separation, um, some forms of violence, et cetera, but also thinking about the delivery of cash programming and how we can reduce child protection risks within uh, the modality for delivery. And then for the GBV note, um, you know, we also see as, as Stefan included in his summary, um, great potential for reducing GBV risks uh, through cash. Um, but as Barbara mentioned, there are also you know, significant possibilities for creating or exacerbating GBV risks um, in the way we deliver our cash programming. So the goal for that note is really just to help colleagues working in other sectors um, that are using cash modality to think about uh, GBV risks throughout the program cycle and to weigh kind of pros and cons of different forms of cash from a GBV risk perspective. So, whether it's electronics based system or um, cash in hand, how we can think about what the GBV risks might be and then proactively address those. Um, so as I said, the, the guidance has been developed. It's still more or less internal at the moment. Um, we'll be doing some field testing later this year and in early 2021, but um, we can, we can um, share those resources shortly. That's it for me, thanks.
Okay, thank you, Christine. So I will go to the next slide now. And I would like to take us through on behalf of the task team members. Um, and again, I'm Joanna Friedman and I'm working for UNFPA's humanitarian office in Geneva and representing today a number of our country offices as well. But I would like to take us through an interagency tool, which is part of the CVA and GBV compendium that I mentioned. Um, and it's a very simple tool whose audience incorporates all of the colleagues who are on the line today. So GBV experts, protection experts, and cash experts from any sector. Um, and it brings together the concepts of protection mainstreaming as well as some of the more specific concepts within GBV. So the intended users are across uh, protection GBV and cash working groups or coordination groups. And we know that all agencies and sectors are responsible for GBV and protection mainstreaming. So any of the sectors that are using CBA, as well as the basic needs working group, should be ensuring that this type of analysis is carried out and ideally in an interagency way. So in terms of the main questions that we're asking ourselves with this tool, we want to know how will our agency or our coordination group work with others to address these questions and from where will you gather the necessary information to fill this out. So you could be looking at protection assessments, GBV situation analyses, and other types of existing assessments, working with um, your GBV and protection colleagues. And you don't necessarily need to be looking at primary data collection. So it's important to mention that it is an interagency tool. It should be filled out with the support of protection and GBV colleagues. And if you are planning to involve beneficiaries or anyone in the affected population that you're working with, then questions must be carried out by GBV specialists. So if you're thinking about key informant interviews or focus groups, that should be carried out by specialists if you're asking sensitive questions. Um, so the, the purpose of this tool is to ensure that partners who are planning CVA are analyzing context-specific protection and GBV risks and also identifying mitigation me measures together. And if it's not perfectly filled out, that's okay. It's about the process and about bringing together expertise across these different areas to, um, to think through this um, together. So if we look, for example, at some of the columns and rows, um, we have a column on GBV risks, which should be context specific, and we have a column on GBV types. Um, we include that, so if we think about GB type, GBV types such as child marriage or intimate partner violence, we include that in terms of GBV types because it would lead to a different kind of response, even if there are financial uh, aspects of that risk. There may be different responses based on the type of GBV. And when we say potential benefits in this area, we're talking about, for example, um, a potential increase in women's decision making, or for example, using some of the delivery mechanisms that we use for cash and voucher assistance, such as mobile phones, to double as channels for information dissemination around GBV referral pathways um, or other important protection and GBV information. So the question we ultimately want to answer is, are we reasonably confident that given our mit mitigation mechanisms, which have been identified by different humanitarian agencies, by local partners, hopefully by women and girls, but through case managers and GBV specialists, um, are we reasonably confident that we can mitigate existing GBV and protection risks and not cause further harm? And in most cases, we can mitigate the risk, but we need to plan in advance, which is why it's so important to carry out this kind of GBV risk analysis very early on in the response analysis phase or in the design phase. And if it hasn't been carried out, to do it as quickly as possible and adapt our program accordingly. Um, so this is a very simple table, which is an annex to the CVA and GBV compendium, as I mentioned, and has also been adapted by different agencies within their internal tools. And in the CVA and GBA, GBV compendium, it is paired with a decision tree uh, tool. And this decision tree will guide you through the kinds of questions around um, balancing those risks and mitigation measures and deciding um, if, if there are adaptations that can be made to the details of the CBA in order to mitigate risks, or if ultimately um, the decision to go forward needs to be paused while, while those risks are mitigated. Um, so some of the main questions that this would help us to ask are what are the protection and GBV risks? Are the risks specific to, uh, to CBA? And these are the questions within the decision tree. Um, will some people be prevented from accessing the intervention? So we see in the, in the row on safe and dignified access, 
We're trying to look specifically at access to the delivery mechanisms of CDA for all of our uh, affected population, including women and girls and others who may be more vulnerable or have uh, cross-cutting um, GBV risks. Um, and also what sort of accountability mechanisms can be put in place. Um, because one of the ways that we can also mitigate risks is by using our accountability mechanisms and regular monitoring. So that's one example of a GBV risk analysis tool and we hope that um, you'll be able to use this and it's, um, we'll share the links to the resources from, from which you can download it at the end. Um, and also please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I am just pausing because there is some space potentially right now already to um, address a few um, questions about uh, your presentation, uh, basically specifically about this tool right now. Um, but uh, uh, if there aren't, we can just um, postpone that um, to the general uh, uh, Q&A at the end. I think um, like looking at the, the chat box, there isn't so much yet, right? So shall we just um, uh, bundle them all together in the end? <clears throat> Joanna, do you agree? Yes, that's fine. We can, we can look at those in the Q&A. Thank you. Cool. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Then um, we're now moving into the uh, third part of the webinar, which is uh, the best practices and learn lessons learned from the field. Um, various organizations have kindly agreed to present a few um, of their um, examples. And we'll start with CARE, who present on cash for GBV uh, outcomes in Ecuador. The presenter presenters are Monica Toba and Catalina Vargas. And I will hand over to you. Thank you, Stefan. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to share with you the experience of cash for GBB in, in Ecuador. First, I will present a brief context in which this process takes place. Um, it's important to mention that the first pilot we did was in November 2019. And after that, we have implemented another four process. So for the first pilot of cash for GBV was focused on addressing the Venezuelan humanitarian crisis. In our country, there are around 500,000 Venezuelans. Our country was struggling uh, to provide by, uh, basic services to its citizens, and its services are trying to expand to also cover the Venezuelan population. However, the crisis of the pandemic has worsened the situation and the budget for social policies has been reduced and is supposed a high risk for refugee and migrants. Also, it's important to say that the gender-based violence is affecting, and this, um, uh, is affecting us and display communities. Uh, seven out of 10 women in Ecuador uh, have experienced some kinds of gender-based violence. And COVID has also worsened the situation because protection system have collapsed in our country, and women uh, don't have access to the system. And I say uh, those things because the other four projects that we uh, implement, we do during the last four months. So in, um, here in Ecuador, uh, there is a framework for gender violence, but there is a little application, resource, and will to do so. So the gaps translate into underserved and underprotected displaced population. And the government has more than 20 years of experience in social safety nets, however limited humanitarian experience in CBA, and it was demonstrated in this um, last crisis, I mean in the COVID crisis. And finally, the civil society organizations are working hard to bridge in gender service delivery and during the COVID, they have demonstrated a lot of creativity to fill those gaps. So that is the context in which we implement our process. Now I would like to explain the process of how we work in cash uh, for GBB. 
In the first pilot, we were supported by the Women Refugee Commission, and our intervention have based in, on two key resources on CBA and GBB that uh, Joanna mentioned before. The first one, toolkit for optimizing a cash-based intervention for, pro, for protection from gender-based violence. And this toolkit was developed by the Women Refugee Commission, IRC, and Mercy Corps. And the second one was the Cash and Voucher Assistant and Gender-Based Violence Compendium that was founded by CARE and, it, and is the collective effort of 15 humanitarian organizations. In this pilot, um, we are realized that the local uh, partners are very important actors because they are close to the people needs and know the context and the available services in the territories. So we have worked with them in the pilot and also in this other project related to cash for GBB. And when, and when I say local partners, I mean mainly with women-led organizations. So what is the process? At the beginning, CARE signed agreements with those partners and we do an inception workshop to share the methodology and we change the experiences regarding the expertise of each organization. After that, the local organization identified women who are suffering gender-based violence or women that are in risk. After that, they have the first approach with them to take a, sur to take a survey and document the case. And with them, they build a for, for them and um, they begin the case management that includes psychosocial assistal, assistance and legal support. After that, CARE make the cash transfer through Carlos ATM. And after two or three weeks, the organization come back with these women that are suffering uh, gender-based violence to know the impact of the cash and the progress of their plan. And they make the post-distribution monitoring. And when the project ends, CARE used to make an after-action review with partners and participants. So what is the lesson learned about those processes? So far, we have assisted 700 survivors of gender-based violence, and we have worked with five women-led organizations around the, around the country. Because it's, it's guaranteed that the implementation is locally led, contextually appropriate, and engage diverse local services providers. The inception, the inception workshops and after action review were valued by all partners. This affords straight roles and responsibilities, establish, establish a sense of teamwork across department and organizations, create by in for new ways of working, and lay the uh, foundation for a strong, a strong coordination and action-oriented learning. And it's important because we create confidence with these organizations and we can implement another process. Uh, also, another lesson is that knowledge and skill were, were exchanged between GBB and CBA staff across partner, resulting in service provider breaking out of silos. And I have an example related to that. We used to work uh, with a government-led organization that is in the border with Colombia. And this organization during this COVID crisis created a system where the woman had a chance to access uh, for protection services if they are suffering gender-based violence. And you know, during this period, women don't have access to report these, um, these violences because they are living with their per perpetrator. And, um, and the organization created a system through emojis. So uh, a woman who are suffering gender-based violence Send an, send an emoji to the organization, and the organization coordinates the local system and with other organizations to give assistance to, the, to this woman. So this kind of experience, we have the chance uh, to, to, to exchange, and we have the chance to replicate in other cities or in other territories. The, another um, lesson learned is that the process of creating a referral pathway of CVR results in new opportunities to promote existing GBB referral pathways in the province expanding community awareness, in particular among crisis affected population. And finally, the Carless ATM was successful delivery mechanism. 
it was well received by participants and initiated their link for um, their link to formal financial system and cool in the future and hence financial inclusion. So that is the experience of, of CARE Ecuador in cash for GBV. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. That was already a very interesting um, first example. I'm now handing over um, to Alexandra, Bra Alexandra Blackwell from IRC uh, to present on cash and IPV in Northeast uh, Seer, a study that uh, the IRC has realized there, conducted there. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, so this is a study that IRC undertook as part of the DFID UK's global program on what works to prevent violence against women and girls. And the aim of this study was to examine in an acute emergency setting, the change in women's experiences of violence, negative coping, including sexual exploitation, and other measures of well-being uh, before and after their households received cash. We worked to answer this question by pre-positioning an evaluation of cash transfers in an acute emergency, which included mapping potential emergencies and exploring the feasibility of different study designs. And what we landed on was conducting the study in Raqqa governance Syria. Um, the research and intervention occurred between March and August 2018. And while the conflict had been ongoing for seven years at that point, um, it mirrored an acute emergency in that setting because the locations where we did the study were only just becoming accessible to organizations after the region had been um, liberated from ISIS control. And in addition, the areas were also hosting a large number of internally displaced, displaced persons from Raqqa um, after the airstrikes that had occurred in 2016 and 2017. Um, the cash transfer program that we evaluated was a standard acute emergency three-month multi-purpose unconditional cash transfer program that was delivered to the heads of households, um, both men and women, that were targeted based on vulnerability criteria. And the theory of change for this type of program is fairly simple. Uh, cash transfers are intended to reduce the basic needs of households in an acute emergency and help them address their basic needs. Um, but we wanted to explore this theory of change further and, and look at some of the hypothesized pathways of unintended changes from this three-month unconditional cash transfer program. And so based on existing literature, um, and program experience, we knew that cash had the potential to change protection outcomes in terms of reducing negative coping, including sexual exploitation, um, and that cash could also reduce intimate partner violence by decreasing household stress as families were able to meet their basic needs, or it could either reduce or exacerbate IPV as women's control of cash or decision-making changes fluctuated within the home. And so based on the feasibility and ethical considerations for the setting, um, we chose a pre-post study to measure these outcomes. And at Endline, we had a final sample of 456 women with roughly 10% attrition from baseline. Um, we used audio computer assisted self-interviewing, a coffee technology for sensitive items um, with an external team of female data collectors. And we conducted additional qualitative interviews at Endline with 40 women. And before we go on to the findings, I just want to say um, a few of the limitations um, that may have infected our ability to interpret results. So firstly, we had a small sample and no comparison group. And so the pre-post design really limits our ability to make any causal inferences from these findings. Um, the study was also not able to make inferences regarding changes in commercial sexual exploitation and abuse, because these questions had to be removed at end line due to increased scrutiny of the study. Um, the study also only interviewed one woman per household and it did not have the viewpoints from other members of the household um, and all items were self-reported which could lead to underreporting due to the sensitive nature of the items um, or potentially also over-reporting if participants thought it could re result in increased aid. Um, programmatically, we also wanted to note that uh, the transfer was developed to meet 80% of household needs which is not the full survival minimum expenditure basket, um, which is more typical of IRC standard emergency responses, um, but it was what was uh, being implemented in the region at the time. And so that may have also uh, affected our results. So we can go to the next slide. I don't know if I have control, thank you. 
Um, and so again, just saying that the cash program was not intended to do any of these things except to help households meet their basic needs. Um, but you can see some of the pathway of unintended consequences here. Um, between baseline and endline, we saw that there were fairly consistent positive changes in reducing basic needs and met most negative coping items. But we also saw that there was either no change or worsened protection outcomes. So the program achieved its intended aim of helping households to meet their basic needs. Food insecurity decreased, um, but we, and we saw overall reductions in economic-related negative coping. So uh, things such as family debt, begging, selling non-productive, unproductive assets, and skipping rent um, decreased significantly. We also saw no change um, or increased employment-related negative coping, such as child labor and exploitative work for women, but this was likely due more to the short duration of the program and the fact that the um, program was occurring within their agricultural harvest season. We saw that household stress stayed the same, um, and we explored this further in our qualitative interviews and found that um, many women reported that the cash did reduce household tension, um, it reduced stress, uh, temporarily and increased their self-efficacy. Um, that really came through in some of the interviews. But we also found that um, it increased community and family jealousy for those who are receiving the cash transfers. Um, and also former means of financial support from other family and community members had stopped and not continued at the time of endline um, for those women. Um, and, and several women also really emphasized the stress about the program ending and what the future held for their families. Um, however, we did see positive trends in decision-making among married women. We saw that decision-making trended more toward joint decision-making at Enbine, um, or both equally decision-making. For unmarried women, we saw that it trended toward more independent decision-making or mainly me decisions. And we saw reductions in other categories being involved in decision making. And this also came out in our qualitative interviews. But for intimate partner violence, what we found across the board was that IPV increased among married women um, and significantly for sexual IPV and economic abuse. In terms of sexual IPV, our Syria program teams um, hypothesized that this could have been due to um, Changes in sexual coercion or using poor sex as a way for a man to reassert power over his wife. Um, and that economic abuse, which also significantly increased, was also a form of control. Um, again, we cannot infer causality from these findings. Our design of the study limits our ability to draw strong conclusions from this. Um, we also want to note that this could have been due to increased comfort and trust between respondents and the research team over time from baseline to endline. Um, nevertheless, we feel that these findings are very meaningful for program considerations. And so we have a few learning priorities coming out of this study. Um, the first being that we need to design programs to monitor, minimize, and prevent risk to women and girls throughout the cash program cycle. Um, we need to ensure that there are exit strategies in place to help families transition. And we also need to ethically measure the effects of cash transfers on household members and changes in household dynamics through post-distribution monitoring. And that can be done using some of the tools that were uh, highlighted in the session right before this. Um, and we also need to connect post-distribution monitoring to referral pathways for GBV uh, case management. The second learning priority is that we need to test different design and delivery elements. We can look at the influence on different outcomes, um, how changes in targeting, the size of the transfer, and the duration of the transfer um, program can influence outcomes, and also examine the effect of PLUS models um, and test different types of complementary programs. And then finally, our third learning priority was that we need to transition from short-term emergency to longer -hood livelihood opportunities for women um, and bridge some of that humanitarian development gap and, and link participants in emergency cash assistance programs to some longer term uh, economic recovery and development programs. Um, I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. As we're doing very well on time, um, and I've just saw, seen that there are a few um, 
uh, questions directly related to the case study. Uh, would you mind if I ask you those questions um, right away? Sure, go ahead. So the first that I'm seeing here is, um, huh? like chat is, 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 is jumping a bit. Um, if, if there was a cash plus approach or only CVA, I think if you've uh, already mentioned a, a little bit, um, sort of what kind of a project design it was, maybe you can uh, answer that. The second one, um, the outcomes in CRS saw an increase in IPV and economic abuse. So what about the do no harm principles? What are the lessons learned to prevent increase um, or already uh, in, in project design? Um, Alexandra, can you explain further on uh, on what, how the, the short period of assistance, three months, was was to factor on uh, many changes observed, whether positive or negative? Um, predictably, is is key uh, for many of them. Isn't three months too short? Um, when more and more evidence is showing that longer term assistance uh, um, makes more sense, I'm assuming is the end of the sentence. So maybe we'll uh, we'll stop at those three questions. Sure. Well, so um, I can attempt to answer some of these, and I can also share the link to the full report and the project brief um, once we conclude. Um, so in in terms of the cash approach, um, it was cash assistance only, and we really wanted to look at that uh, the emergency cash assistance program for acute emergencies where we only have the capacity to implement um, cash assistance and, and don't have um, comprehensive or expanded programming. And so that was really the uh, initial objective of this study. And so it was not a cash plus approach, um, but based on the findings we're interested in exploring Type, different types of complementary programs and what could be sort of a light touch approach that might be more feasible in these acute emergency settings. Um, but we, again, we were only looking at that um, cash only emergency response um, and the, the potential influence it had on outcomes above that main objective of that type of program, which is just to help households meet their acute basic needs. Um, let's see, so, um, in terms of do no harm, um, this definitely, um, you know, raised some concerns from the program side and, and what we could do in the immediate term and then some possibilities, um, again, for complementary programs and program adjustments in the long term. Um, we held several validation and action planning workshops with the, our, our colleagues in the Syria region to develop um, some plans for new models of programs and pro, um, you know extending cash programs beyond that initial uh, three month period um, as well as linking our case management and other types of um, GBV programming and services to those participants um, and and it also you know we emphasize the need for um, monitoring and, and examining um, you know, doing assessments and monitoring continually within our cash assistance and other types of programs um, for negative outcomes for women and looking at DBD in particular. So again, thinking of some of those uh, tools that were just highlighted by Joanna um, before this session. Mm -hmm. see, sorry, I'm trying to remember the other questions. Uh, the last one. Let, let, I think uh, now that the many, many questions popped up, um, I'm I think maybe it might be better uh, after all to to move them uh, to group them and move them uh, to the end and and, and and proceed with the next um, case study if that's uh, okay for you Alexander yeah yeah thanks cool um, the next one is uh, cash for women's essential hygiene items and protection in Syria uh, so I'll hand back to Joanna from UNFPA Hey, thank you. Um, so representing the colleagues from Syria today um, for this presentation. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about a voucher assistance program which UNFPA is implementing in partnership with WFP in Syria, targeting pregnant and lactating women. Um, so the collaboration on this is part of a larger effort by UNFPA and WFP to provide more comprehensive services to pregnant and lactating women. Uh, both during their pregnancies and during the postpartum period 
and really making sure that the needs of beneficiaries are at the center of the work. Um, so in this case, uh, UNFPA is providing a top-up value to WFP's nutrition e-vouchers so that women can procure hygiene items and they can access over 140 WFP contracted shops using the WFP scope cards. And for those who aren't familiar with that, it's WFP's corporate e-voucher system that they use in different countries. So UNFPA is topping that up and that's based on feedback from women who are really keen to have hygiene items um, in, their, in their distributions. Um, so this is expanding now from a pilot of one governorate um, over the summer period of June to August of this year, which was for about 2000 women. It is now expanding to 12 governorates throughout Syria, which will cover 70,000 pregnant and lactating women. Um, and monthly installments will take place for six months at a time. So the initial pilot was for three months, but it was always with the idea of continuing that for at least six months. Um, and it is for women who are registered under WFP's um, General Food Assistance Program. Um, so I think it's really important to mention that for UNFPA, this is a protection entry point. So these are not just hygiene NFIs, um, but we are looking at this as a connection to UNFPA's existing women and girls safe spaces, static and mobile health clinics, and our implementing partners who help women to access reproductive health services at clinics, help them to access the women and girls safe spaces, um, which includes things like psychosocial activities and livelihoods activities. Um, so this collaboration already includes referrals of pregnant women to um, nutrition related assistance. And now we are including um, this hygiene component and also integrating GBV and sexual and reproductive health messaging into nutrition informational campaigns at distribution points and also at our existing women and girls safe spaces and clinics where we work. Um, so in terms of some of the lessons learned, I'll just switch slides here. So in terms of lessons learned, um, we, we know that um, development of um, standard operating procedures to have strong referrals and access to GBV related services has been um, very important to have clear referrals between um, the implementing partners of both UNFPA and WFP. Um, and we also have specific referrals for uh, sensitive GBV cases. Um, another important lesson learned is around messaging for beneficiary sensitization. Um, so messaging that pertains to the importance of proper nutrition during pregnancy and postpartum, health messages, family planning. Um, we also know that there is a need for a mechanism to um, adjust the transfer value. Um, so that's something that WFP and UNFPA are looking at. And then also we are looking, of course, at beneficiary satisfaction, beneficiary feedback as part of ongoing post-distribution monitoring. So thus far, um, women are happy that there is now the inclusion of hygiene items along with the nutrition e-voucher as it was one of the top demands in the past, um, particularly for um, items like diapers, soap, um, paper towels, which we also think are being used as um, menstrual pads. Um, and so WFP and, and UNFPA will continue to, um, to monitor through the post distribution monitoring and see if there are other urgent needs that need to be addressed and to um, adjust the program accordingly. Um, so we know that that's really instrumental to have that kind of feedback, both through monitoring and through um, accountability mechanisms. Um, and finally, we know that it's important to have a contingency plan in place in a context such as Syria where um, the economic and political situation can, can fluctuate considerably in the coming months. And so um, UNFP and WFP are working together to um, potentially switch to commodity vouchers um, if, there are, if there's high inflation or if prices fluctuate. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joanna. Um, now moving on to the case example of participation uh, of women and girls to mitigate GBV risks uh, of cash programming in Lebanon. Uh, that is an example uh, presented by Empowerment Aid, specifically by Alina Potts. Over to you, Alina. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so greetings, everyone. My name is Alina Potts. I work with the Global Women's Institute, which is based at George Washington University. And I'm going to speak about Empowered Aid, which is a project that we're um, leading with Care Lebanon as partners um, for our work in Lebanon, along with uh, ORDA, which is a Lebanese organization. Um, and the project also takes place in Uganda in partnership with IRC Uganda and World Vision. 
Um, this uh, project is participatory action research uh, over three years and it's in three phases and it's really focused on mitigating sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, my background is in gender-based violence emergency response and um, often being part of SCA reporting mechanisms and as we know a lot of um, a lot of cases go unreported and there's many reasons for that. We have a lot of it um, written up in our findings and you'll find it elsewhere, but a lot of times it's not only the shame and stigma that comes with surviving gender-based violence and, and thinking about seeking help, but also when it comes to sexual exploitation and abuse um, in relation to receiving aid, there's a real fear that that you know, aid will be cut off. There will be retribution. People won't be able to survive. Um, so we look specifically at how do we stop this from happening? How do we make aid distribution safer um, so that there is less chance, there's less risk of sexual exploitation and abuse occurring in the first place? Um, the first thing we did was we worked with refugee women and girls in Lebanon and in Uganda. So in Lebanon, they're from Syria. Um, we worked with a group of 26 women and girls, ages 16 to 52. Um, and over the course of about six months, we worked together to really focus on, you know, what, what do we want to achieve in this research? How do we want to do it? And understanding from them through their observations in their own lives and in their communities, what risk are they seeing in relation to four types of aid? Um, they chose the types of aid. So you can see that there's cash and voucher assistance as well as food, water and sanitation and shelter. Um, in Uganda, the focus was on fuel and firewood instead of cash and voucher, but otherwise the types of aid are the same. These findings are written up in a number of um, documents, a number of reports and briefs that I'll share momentarily, but just to say as part of the process, once we had identified these risks, we also asked them what could be done to make, um, to make these distributions safer, to make accessing these types of aid safer. And so they told us, they gave us a number of recommendations and we went through a prioritization exercise with them and said, you know, which of these are the most important? And in phase two, we're actually testing them. So we're taking what they told us um, and with operational partners, we're applying them to their distribution. So we've, in Lebanon, we're in the midst of um, conducting a pilot with couch, cash and voucher assistance and then also with food. Um, and in Uganda, we are have conducting pilots with food and dignity kit distributions. And so we're trying to apply what they told us and understand not only does it lead to greater um, perceived safety of women and girls when they're accessing these goods or lower perceived risk of SEA, um, but also, you know, how feasible is it? Does it add cost or does it actually maybe make these distributions more efficient and effective and cost effective as well? Um, it's been interesting doing this in the context of COVID-19, but somehow a lot of the recommendations for things like smaller groups for distribution, um, more spacing, et cetera, have actually aligned a lot with um, how distributions need to change under COVID-19. Um, and then in the third phase, we'll be looking at peer-to-peer -peer, um, learning, potentially with the third site in Bangladesh. Um, so anyone working in the Cox Bazaar response is interested in being involved, please get in touch, and also further dissemination uptake. Um, so I want to kind of dive deep, obviously, into the cash and voucher findings for this um, webinar. So you see a quote here from one of the qualitative interviews we conducted with a Syrian adolescent girl living in Lebanon as a refugee. She said she might go to the center or to the organization to receive the cash assistance, and the employee there might ask her to do something in order to grant her the assistance. Although she is registered and has the right to take the assistance, he asked for something in return. He might ask her to go out with him, for example, she is obliged to. So you can see here, and we have many more quotes um, in the reports and briefs that I encourage you to look through and to really read the voices of, of women and girls directly. There's an awareness of being registered. There's an awareness of the right to receive assistance. And yet if um, an aid worker or someone else associated with the aid distribution is demanding sex in exchange for those things, there's also a feeling of have, no, having to do that to be able to get the assistance, having no other options. Um, so awareness raising alone isn't enough, although it's important, but also ensuring that staff are well trained and that we're setting up distribution systems so that um, they're, they're safer. So this can mean, for example, um, things like making sure that um, you know, where women and girls are accessing cash assistance and how they're accessing it, that they have all the information they need to do that. 
um, that it's very clear that if that requires transport, so many of you probably know the context that Lebanon is more urban and peri-urban, um, if there is transport needed, we're thinking of what does transport mean? Because um, you know, taxi drivers, motorcycle drivers, and other contexts, et cetera, can also take advantage in, in their role in these distribution systems. Um, I'll, could you go to the next slide, please? I'll outline a few other recommendations. And as I said, they're contained in the reports, but also in this brief, which is specific to the cash findings in Lebanon. Um, another thing that women and girls talked about was just better engaging them throughout the process, right, of cash and voucher assistance so that they are part of understanding and knowing, um, you know, why is this assistance being targeted the way it is? How is it being used? How can it be accessed? What can they do if there are problems for accessing? And there should be an, a range of ways to com report complaints or give feedback. And they can also support other women and girls to know these things. So, you know, this information often can seem maybe transparent or clear from a kind of 360 degree view, but really working and talking with people in communities, there's a lot of confusion about who gets cash and why and, you know, for how long and what are the reasons that they might stop receiving it. Um, and we really need to make sure these messages are constantly shared in numerous ways through numerous channels. Um, women and girls also talked about creating or having supported their informal or more formal accompaniment mechanisms so that they're able to, for example, travel together, they're able to attend information sessions together, really supporting that kind of dynamic that's really important for women's engagement. And if we're not supporting that, it may be that you're offering information sessions, but women can't actually travel by themselves to get to them. It's too dangerous. Or maybe they don't have childcare um, and there's no way for them to come. Or maybe they're offered at a time of day when women are usually busy. Um, definitely, we've already talked about information sessions a lot, but also better information and communication of complaint and reporting mechanisms. And this means multiple channels. So radio, visual, written, loudspeaker, multiple languages, community meetings, having that information available in health facilities and other places we know women and girls go. And the importance of that is because a lot of the space for exploitation is created by the absence of information. Um, by not knowing, that offers other actors the chance to come in and either say that they have that information or give false information um, and use that to exploit people, use their power over um, in a very negative way. So while community leaders and kind of traditional leadership structures are important to communicate through, we want to also make sure that we're opening up um, the types and number of people that have access to that information because information really is power and that we're engaging different groups of women and girls in the entire process, that they feel confident and comfortable um, contacting your organization or contacting, as Monica highlighted, you know, working with women's organizations as partners, contacting them when there's an issue. So I'll, I'll finish there and just say there's a few pictures here you can see. Um, one of the, the processes that we used was community mapping. So that's the top right. And that can be a great way of understanding where you're working you know, what are dangerous or safe spaces in this community? Where do women go for help? Um, you know, and kind of identifying maybe places to support through your work or gaps that you could help address. Um, doing this in a coordinated fashion, obviously. So a lot of this may be done by GBV actors and maybe it's about GBV and cash actors getting together and reviewing those maps together and, and thinking about how they can fill gaps in a coordinated fashion. Um, also just to share, you'll see a lot of kind of drawings and you see our, our research officer, Farah, in the top left in Lebanon sharing back. So we really had a commitment to a participatory process in, in the design and analysis and application of our research. And we used a lot of visual methods to ensure that literacy wouldn't be a barrier. So this can be a great thing to do as well when you're thinking of information sessions and also sharing information on feedback and complaint reporting mechanisms. Um, so I'll stop there. There's a website at the bottom where we have all of the resources listed, including the brief on cash assistance, and I encourage you to read it and find out more. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, we'll move on right away with the next example, and then after that, I'll go back, as I said before, to all the um, uh, Q&A. So the next example is GBV risk uh, mitigation in cash and uh, HLP in Somalia. And that is an example um, by UNHCA um, presented by Nora Atiendo Oshieng. I hope I... Thank you very much, Stephen. You pronounced it well. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Nora Uchieng. Um, I'm based in Mogadishu, a protection officer working with UNSCR. But at, pre at present, I'm under mandatory quarantine in Uganda. I just came for my rest and recuperation three days ago. So the presentation that I'm going to make is uh, with regard to cash, about assistance in response to forced eviction. Now, forced eviction in Somalia is one of, uh, one of the major risks. But before I introduce the subject, I just wanted to paint a picture of the security situation in Somalia. The security situation in Somalia is fluid, volatile, and unpredictable. Uh, uh, incidences, security incidences such as bombing, um, assassinations, kidnapping, and forced evictions have been reported to occur in areas, especially areas hosting the IDPs, and this is according to the, the UN report. With regard to natural calamities, uh, some of you may be aware uh, incidences such as a drought and flooding is common, but currently uh, we are dealing with, the, with flood response. UNSCR together with other partners are responding to the needs of, uh, the needs of our affected population in certain parts of Somalia that have been affected by floods and we are providing assistance in form of cash, non-food items, emergency shelter kits, uh, dignity, kits, dignity kits and hygiene kits, especially for the women and girls IDPs. Our population, uh, I think it's important to also give a picture of the number of uh, IDPs in Somalia. According to the government statistics, we have about, the latest statistic, we have about 2.6 million IDPs uh, resident in 2,344 IDP sites. And this is according to the CCCM uh, cluster latest dashboard report. Now you're looking at 2.6 million IDPs uh, in about 2,344 IDP sites. Now UNSCR as an organization, we are, with our partners, we are present in about 126. Um, when it comes to returnees, uh, since, 24, since 2014, when we, uh, the tripartite agreement was signed, we have so far received about 95,000 Somali returnees, majority from, from the DAB, and then we have a few from Yemen and also the neighboring countries. Our refugees are not many. We have about 35,000, majority are Yemenis who enjoy prima facie status. So I just wanted to give you a picture, our persons of concern and the numbers. And as you can tell, we have a huge number of IDPs, but what is UNSCR doing? Now I'm going to introduce the issue, the issue of land and forced eviction. Forced eviction is one of those key protection risks that have even been highlighted by the protection cluster in the assessment. There are many protection needs, but for today's discussion, we'll focus on forced eviction and how it has continued to impact the women and girls. And this is a discussion that uh, have also been discussed extensively under the House Land and Property Working Group, which is led by NRC and UNSCR as a member. And so as a result of that, we've had situations where, you know, because of lack of documentation and because land is in the hands of our private individuals, we have even our women, uh, women, uh, women and girls you know, being evicted because of lack of proper documentation. And all this is also attributed to the fact that there are also no strong institutions. And as I'll be taking you through the presentation, we'll also be able to look at whether what the government is doing in terms of putting in place policies, you know, to be able to protect uh, women and even the entire population when it comes to you know, acquisition of property. Our overall objective with regard to this uh, particular subject is to reduce or mitigate uh, evictions. And by doing that, we'll also be reducing the vulnerability because forced eviction exposes women and girls to further protection SDBV risks. Now, what have UNSCR done with regard to, in order to mitigate these incidences of uh, forced evictions? One, uh, in terms of eviction mapping and some of these activities, what we have done with our partners in Baidu and even Mogadishu is whereby we work with the, the partners and also the the, the community leaders to map areas that are at risk of eviction. So what we are doing, this particular exercise serves two purposes. One is to prevent it from occurring and also uh, there's the prevention because when we're able to map the areas that are at risk, then the community is able to inform us and we intervene in a timely manner. But in situations where it has occurred, it's also important because we're working closely with the community and therefore when it occurs, we can be able to respond in a timely manner. It's also important to note that we also work closely with the government in this aspect. And when it occurs, there's also the joint participatory assessment. We work together with other sister agencies and other, uh, other NGOs, where in the event that it occurs, we are able to conduct an assessment to find out the exact needs. And this is where, in the event that the population, the affected population um, uh, requests or prefers the cash, then the cash assistance will be provided. In some situations, we are able to provide NFI, such as the dignity kits or the hygiene kits or the emergency shelter kits. Or in most situations, sometimes it could be the cash and the, the NFIs. So the, target, the targeted assistance in this case would be persons who are identified. And this, in this case, could be the female-headed household. It could be the, the girls. 
it will be the vulnerable women who enjoy the cash. And now, as I move to the next slide, please, we'll be looking at some of the lessons that uh, we have learned with regard to cash assistance and forced eviction in general. Now, since uh, when COVID began, a moratorium was issued, and I think we'd be interested to also learn how we have been able to track the moratorium. What this means was that we were asked to actually advocate with the government to reduce, uh, I mean, to prevent evictions. And since March to June, under the HLP working group, we were able to um, observe that the eviction rates had actually dropped from almost 16,000 in March when it was issued to 2,000. So in a way, you can say the advocacy, uh, successful advocacy on moratorium reduced evictions. And if we are linking post evictions, with uh, uh, associating it with the SDBB, then in a way we are able to also prevent incidences of SDBB from occurring. But that is not to say that evictions are, is not taking place. It's still taking place, but with our uh, collaboration with the government and uh, the community and other uh, humanitarian actors, we've been able to control, uh, to reduce the rate of evictions. What we have also learned is that the importance of uh, including and working uh, with, the, with all the stakeholders, men, women, the government authorities, and also the get, gatekeepers. And if I may just mention briefly about the gatekeepers, especially in, in uh, Mogadishu, these are sort of uh, uh, informal structures. They neither report to the government or the community. And therefore, if we really have to protect our IDPs, it's important that we bring them on board and have a consultation with them, leave no one behind when it comes to um, coming up with the interventions that are geared at protecting our IDPs. Uh, with regard to comprehensive risk analysis in the context of cash, as my colleagues also mentioned, the previous speakers, that was uh, Barbara and uh, Jennifer, they mentioned that we should be responsible when we're using the cash. And I do agree because sometimes when you conduct the risk analysis, and I'll give an example, let's say post eviction has, has taken place and one of the prioritized needs is shelter. And so if you go out in the market, you find out that in as much as yes, you have consulted the community and they prefer cash, but in the risk analysis, or in the market analysis, you find out that the, the, the prices for the shelter is high or the distance you know, to buy these items are high. So if you give uh, the affected population cash, then you're likely to uh, um, expose them to further harm. Because remember, I've also mentioned in terms of context and the security, the environment is volatile. So you don't want a situation whereby you're giving cash to individuals who will be walking almost 10 miles to get shelter, shelter, uh, shelter materials or you find that the materials in the market are expensive and therefore the money you're giving them might not even be used for the intended purpose. So that's why the risk analysis is very important. Sometimes you may give that money, but also when you also do the uh, post distribution monitoring. So this is how we've also been able to, you know, inform our program when it comes to cash. So there are situations where in as much as that was the wish, but we go back and negotiate with them and, and explain to them why we are not able to give the cash. Because by doing that, we also build trust. There's also the little understanding on uh, the little understanding of HLP rights. Again, uh, it's important to empower and capacitate our persons of concern. The national legislation that have been drafted and uh, which which uh, has started, uh, which which actually protects our persons of concern. And therefore, once these policies have been formulated, I think it's only fair that we break it down and inform our persons of concern of the rights. Eviction in itself is not uh, illegal, but if it's done within the confines of the law, and this is where, for instance, if uh, we're talking to our persons of concern. Normally, uh, evictions take place where the landlord either, you know, violates the lease agreement. And therefore, just informing them that, you know, this land has been leased for this number of years, and therefore, you should know that you can only be evicted after. Or if you hear that it's uh, about to occur, then inform. You know, so just, just basic information about what they need to do in the event that, they, that it occurs, and also empowering them with the national legislation that actually advocates for their rights is very crucial. Identifying and uh, utilizing favorable, favorable protection environment. For this particular point, I just wanted to emphasize that, yes, it is the primary responsibility of the government to protect its citizens, including our IDPs. But in our context, for instance, the humanitarian actors and also UNSCR, especially in the camps where the IDPs are residing, what are we doing? How are we protecting them? Um, so one, if you're talking of joint assessments and if you're talking of uh, safety audit assessments, if you're talking of uh, any other assessment that maybe uh, is carried out jointly with other actors and you find, for instance, that women are complaining that there are elements, uh, armed elements penetrating into the segment, they are unable to use the wash facilities and they are unsafe at night. So with that, with that kind of an assessment, you are able to, one, install the solar lighting, when you fence the, the, the when you fence the camp and also maintain the sites, maintaining sites in this case could be clearing the bushes because maybe the women feel unsafe when they're going to collect water or firewood. So in that way, we we, we can argue that in a way, as humanitarian actors, UNSCR, 
we are uh, protecting uh, the we are protecting our POCs by um, intervening or providing some of these. Uh, I mean, uh, programming programming according to the assessment that have been uh, uh, revealed during the, the the discussion with our persons of concern, and therefore the overall objective has always been uh, to improve the protection of women, the cash support. Uh, as I also mentioned, insulation of solar lights, distribution of dignity kits, site maintenance, uh, which is also informed by the safety audit. So we have also learned that listening to the voices of persons of concern, and in the event that we are not able to meet their needs, that is where now I go to my last point, which is linking to other services. Because the needs are great, the needs are many, and with the limited funding, we may not be in a position as an organization to meet the needs of, of our IDPs, but collaborating and working closely with uh, other actors, with the government, we are in a way try to meet uh, the needs of our persons of concern. And therefore, uh, from my side, that is all from Somalia with regard to forced eviction. Thank you and back to you, Stefan. Thank you so much. That was also a very, um, very exciting example, Nora. Um, we're now closing the, uh, which I thought uh, were uh, a number of very exciting examples. So best practices and lessons learned from the field and moving on into um, the questions and answers. Um, so we have already collected a lot of uh, questions and answers and um, have grouped them together. So we will start by um, asking uh, a few uh, to Joanna um, on the GB risks and um, benefits analysis tool and then go uh, ag again step by step um, to the questions from the field examples. Um, so Joanna, if I may, um, I, I, would, I would start off with the question that was asked, can you explain uh, the potential ben benefits um, column in the, in the tool, the potential benefits um, column? Can you, can you go into more detail here? Sure, and I just want to say as well that I think Luana has put in the in the chat box um, links to the CVA and GBB compendium. So in the larger resource, you can also see examples and not just the blank template. Um, but the benefits uh, column is meant to also have us think about how using the modality of cash or voucher assistance could actually contribute to um, either reducing GBV risks or um, not creating new risks that could be created if we were using in-kind assistance. So for example, um, we know that CVA, when it's paired with complementary activities, when CVA is part of a more holistic program, and that it can contribute to feelings of women's empowerment, for example, um, and that also women are more able to um, contribute to the household needs, and that in many cases they also um, there's also a decrease in household tension during the time, at least when the cash is given, that um, there's an ability to meet those household needs. There are, of course, other examples as well, but just to say that it, we need to be able to also think about some of those additional benefits of actually using the modality of cash or vouchers. Um, another thing that I mentioned earlier is that um, electronic cash or voucher assistance can also be um, very discreet. It can be given in multiple tranches. Um, and it allows women to access resources and services. So indeed, also in that case, in, rather than an in-kind distribution, we know that mobile phones or other types of electronic um, vouchers can also um, have additional protection and GBV um, risk uh, benefits um, in terms of not exacerbating risks or even contributing to a more discrete um, distribution of assistance. Thanks. The, the second question also related to the tool is what is the difference between the context specific GBV uh, risks and the GBV types in, in the tool? Okay, yes. And this is, I think, more of a difficult one for, for those of us who are not GBV and protection experts to sort of break that down. And again, in the compendium, there is a table that gives you some examples of that. Um, but in terms of risk, so for example, if we look at um, older persons and, and older women in particular, they may be um, potentially more at risk of being targeted for theft or assault um, if it's known that they're receiving CVA. So this could be um, an issue with the targeting as part of the design, um, or it could be in the way that, um, that information is shared um, in communities. And so it's something to look out for. And so the GBV risks would be the targeting of older women and the, the type would be assault, for example, in this case. Um, something that might be a little bit more complicated, but which we've seen in a few contexts recently, 
um, it's not widespread, so I, I mention it just as one other example, um, is that sometimes when there's an increase in household in income, we might see that families are actually better able to afford bride price or dowry, which could lead to um, the unintended consequence of an increase in forced child marriage or early marriage, and that would be the GBV type. So again, these are very context specific, which is why we don't have one template which is already completely filled out because it really depends on the context and what is happening in the context at that time. And these are the kinds of things that our GBV and protection and gender colleagues might already know about in terms of major risks in the context from their existing assessments and analysis. And so we'd like CVA experts and gender GBV and protection experts to come together and sort of brainstorm about these risks in that context and also think about, as well as I mentioned, some of the different um, delivery mechanism, mechanisms of CVA that could actually contribute to reducing some of those risks or at least to not causing further harm. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, a third question and the last one um, that we grouped together um, is, is uh, re regarding the GBV uh, risks and uh, benefits analysis tool is how do you ensure that all the different uh, or common threats are covered when working with this tool since it works with them in, in bulk, basically? I mean, it's, it, I, I think we can't be certain that we will always cover 100% of the risks in the risk analysis tool. And that's really for, for any types of risk, whether it's reputational or fraud or protection in GBV. Um, but that's why we should have as well other aspects of our program, such as um, post-distribution monitoring, which may be household surveys, but may also be, um, in, the, in the case of the COVID context, one-on-one -on -one calls with a sample of women and girls um, once COVID has moved on, and maybe focus group discussions with women and girls, and checking on some of the mitigation mechanisms that we've put in place, checking if risks have been mitigated and if those mitigation measures have been effective, um, and also having strong accountability mechanisms in place throughout the life of the program. So I think we, we, we can't say that we can be 100% exhaustive in terms of mapping every single risk, um, but at least, bringing, at least bringing the CVA and GBV and gender and protection experts together means that we can cover some of the major risks that we're seeing in a context at a given time, and we're much more likely to put in, into place mitigation measures if we identify those risks early on. Thanks a lot, Joanna. Um, now, moving on to the uh, best practice and lessons learned from the field, um, there are a few more questions uh, to Alexandra from, uh, from IRC. I think that uh, partly these questions have been um, already answered, but also on the other hand, maybe not uh, um, also the, 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 the initial pro project design maybe isn't so clear yet. Um, I know the project a little bit, but um, let's just uh, hand it back to you, Alexandra, to maybe clarify a few points. Um, the first one is, uh, where are you distributing the cash directly to the abused women in male-headed households? And I'm gonna ask the second together, because it, um, well, it comes basically in the same, uh, this, it's the same sort of uh, subject, that the assistant, uh, assistance only target survivors or the perpetrators as well in, in IPD. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the program was a, uh, what is a very common emergency cash assistance program. It was targeted to households meeting socioeconomic eligibility criteria for cash assistance to meet their basic needs. So it was not targeted specifically to women within the household. It was not targeted specifically to GBV survivors, um, it was targeted to the household generally based on that social, socioeconomic vulnerability criteria. Um, and women were also not specifically targeted as the recipients of cash. It was distributed directly to the head of household regardless of gender. Um, so again, this is a very common model in emergency cash assistance. Um, and, and so we wanted to test, to assess whether that model um, was influencing the well-being of women and, and potentially influencing GBV. Um, and the, the amount of the cash transfer also was determined based on um, la the larger coordination mechanism within the region, the amount and duration of the cash transfer. Thanks a lot, uh, Alexandra. 
Um, back to you, Joanna, um, because now it, it's the, the case example um, question. What kind of training was provided to staff for this approach that you presented? Uh, for example, to make referrals, uh, safe referrals. Okay, or other yes. Things? So Right, so for the staff involved in the UNFPA and WFP uh, joint e-voucher program in Syria, um, staff were trained on the basic concepts and principles um, around GBV, so including safe referrals in case of disclosure. Um, and we will also be working on making a case study from that, um, from that project, and so hopefully we'll be able to share that in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, to the example from Empowerment Aid, uh, so the question for Alina, um, are there any mechanisms for the women and girls to report these, these abuses? And um, are, there, are they aware of them? Uh, do they trust those mechanisms in, in your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are mechanisms for reporting. So in Lebanon, there's... Um, you know, there's a PSEA working group. They've done a great job um, getting a lot of improved information and systems into place. So there's mechanisms for reporting, but there is a lot of distrust and hesitation to report. Um, so this is something that came up in all of our, um, in both countries and all of the places that we worked. Um, for example, I, I'll just give you an example from one of the qualitative interviews about um, not only fear and hesitation to report to formal mechanisms, but also to share with one's family or community. Um, so for example, one of them said, one of the girls we talked to said, sometimes if the girl tells her parents and they are reasonable, they will go to a children's rights association and provide them with information about the incident and offender, such as his phone number, his details, his picture. They might find him and interrogate him, but he can deny the incident. I know a lot of girls who went through this. Parents sometimes insist on knowing what's wrong with their girl and urge her to speak so she tells them everything. Some parents are understanding and open while some parents are not and might prohibit her from doing everything. They even might beat her and blame her. That was one. And then just quickly from a community group discussion we had with refugee men. So we also talked to men and boys in this research. One of them said, he might ask her to give him a certain thing. I worked with the UN in Syria. One of the employees tried to hold a woman's hand, so she called for her neighbor. The employee tarnished her reputation, and even though she is an honorable woman, people kept talking about her. It all depends on the way they, meaning men, were raised. So just to see there's kind of different uses of power there. There's ways that, um, you know, reputation or, or standing in the community can be affected. There's a lot of power dynamics that we, we are often not completely aware of. Um, although the communities and the, the women and girls we talked to are very aware of them. And we see how, especially with adolescent girls, that's also um, related to how, you know, the relationship with their family and whether they feel safe talking to um, family members or whether they might be further blamed. So I, I'll just say that there's a lot of barriers there. There's a lot of things that make reporting very difficult, but we do know that some people will want to access those systems. So we have to make sure Sure they're in place and we have to make sure they're in place in multiple ways as I said and that we are connecting with trusted community sources to help get the information out and then we also have to always expect that a number of cases are going unreported hence the importance of all of us whatever our role being part of mitigating gender-based violence and SCA and ensuring that whatever we're doing we're trying to put in place ways to do it safely and address known risks um, so that we can reduce these things happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, a second question would be, um, what do you, from your perspective, how do you value um, or what's the, what's the added value of training of staff, male staff, maybe uh, in specific on PSEA and, and, and on zero tolerance policies on ethics uh, and compliance um, as, um, and, and structures? And has that been also part of your uh, project? Yeah, it has been part of our project. So, um, you know, I think it's very important, but I think the word training can mean many things, right? So if it's kind of a tick box exercise, people come together for a few hours and, you know, aren't really engaged and kind of given a lot of information and then considered trained, um, that's probably not really getting to the, the depth of understanding and reflection that's needed to be able to effectively train on SE and other forms of GBV. Um, one of the things that we did was we developed 
um, facilitation guides for the trainings that we did, and we've shared all of those on the website. So I'll put the website into the chat in a second, and you can actually see in our facilitation guides, um, while it's a training on participatory action research on SEA, it includes a section on, you know, training around SEA and gender-based violence that really starts at core concepts. And we found, especially in our second phase in the pilots with the, for example, food distribution, um, and also with the cash and voucher pilot, you know, there's a lot of staff who um, maybe don't, aren't as aware as we think of exactly what exploitation is and what consent is. And there's a lot of victim blaming. And this happens also among community members that we worked with. So a lot of our first work was to have processes, to have um, exercises that we could do together that really opened up those issues and allowed us to address them rather than pretend they don't exist and kind of push them under the rug and move forward. So we really need to start with ourselves. Um, it's often an ongoing conversation. There's some great work that IRC is doing through a project called Listen Up that uses a curriculum by a wonderful Ugandan organization named Raising Voices, and it's called the Get Moving Curriculum, and it really looks at organizational culture um, around, you know, being better at addressing GBV and SEA. So I recommend all of these resources, and I'll, I'll put them in the chat. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much, Alina. And moving on to the UNHCR, UNHCR example that Nora presented. So one uh, participant asks, uh, can you say more on the extent to which documentation actually uh, helps prevent evictions? From that um, participant's experience, this has never been uh, a very powerful protection in Mogadishu specifically. Nora, may I just interrupt you for one second? You are a little bit uh, far away. Okay. Before, when you presented, you were much clearer. Okay, can you hear me now? Let me Better. The second question, uh, very straightforward. Uh, can you share the tools for the risks uh, of eviction map mapping? Uh, yes, uh, so I also want to mention that when this particular activity is under the CCCM cluster by UNSCR colleague alongside IOM. And I can share our uh, focal points after this, I can share the tools that have been used to perform this particular task. This is a task that is mainly under the uh, calm coordination and calm management. So I can Thank you. Join the team. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, now that's um, that's all from the uh, from the best practice and lessons learned from the field section. Unless there are uh, questions uh, um, to care. Um, so far, we haven't seen any in the chat. But please, if there are any, um, uh, please just mention them in, in the chat. Um, a few other questions, um, um, sort of, and, and that is to all uh, presenters um, from the. Um, from the best practice and lessons learned from the field. Um, are there good, from, from your uh, point of view, are there good practices of linking how CVA addresses the most immediate humanitarian protection needs? 
with how um, it can also build resilience at individual and community level in terms of protection as well. Does anyone have an answer here for, for us? I can also repeat the question. So the, the question was, are there good practices of linking how CVA addresses the most immediate humanitarian protection needs? And as I understand here, the question says, in how it can also build resilience at the same time at individual and community level in terms of protection. Hi, Stefan, I think I can jump in on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are other resources as well that we haven't necessarily put here, but which are in the Cash Learning Partnership website. Um, if you look at the um, protection thematic resources, or we can share a few links afterwards, but there is a, um, a three country study from UNHCR that looked at their programming in Ecuador, Lebanon, and Morocco, um, that looked at GBV outcomes, but also at broader um, sort of livelihoods and resilience related outcomes. So in Ecuador in particular, the cash that was um, part of the was part of a um, what they call the graduation approach program, which has more than just an immediate humanitarian need in terms of objectives and looks at women's resilience a little bit more in the medium to longer term. So I would definitely encourage you to look at that resource. And there are also a few um, studies that are noted in some of the evidence reviews, which are also in the um, in the resources on CALP, and they're also I believe on the GPV AOR website, and some of them are on the GPC website. So. You can't miss them, but um, there's a series of, of evidence reviews that, that was commissioned, um, I believe, last year, which um, all have kind of the same look on the CALP website. So look out for those. Thanks a lot. I'm just going to pause for a second to see if uh, any of the other presenters wants to add anything. If not, we have a question from Christelle from the uh, Mine Action Area of Responsibility who asks, um, they have a few examples uh, of use of cash and voucher assistance in Mine Action and the task team um, has a consultant uh, at the moment researching this topic. So do presenters or other um, um, participants in, the, in this webinar have examples of use of cash for vi victim uh, assistance and disability inclusion specifically? So maybe already for this question, um, if we can give our participants the opportunity to un unmute themselves. So we'll, we'll enable that now and you can unmute yourself um, if you have, for example, for this question, um, but there will be also other questions where we're gonna actually ask you something and, and, and would be interested to hear uh, from you. Again, this question was if, um, people have examples of use of cash for victim assistance and disability inclusion. Again, if you, it's now possible, anyone who wants to um, uh, share anything on the subject can just unmute themselves. Stefan, this is Christine from UNICEF. Um, so within the child protection and cash guidance that I mentioned, um, there are some references to disability considerations. They're quite general and they're not um, specific examples from country context, but um, that might be something worth starting with. And also, uh, you know, happy to help connect with um, colleagues that work in our disabilities team, if that would be helpful for uh, Christophe. Thanks a lot, Christine. Um, if there are any other questions from participants, then um, please raise them now. I'm, in the meantime, I'm just gonna ask two questions that we have uh, sort of prepared for you. The first one uh, for you as uh, participants of this webinar. Um, the first one is, has the COVID-19 pandemic forced you uh, as practitioners to adapt your CVA programming due to added GBV risks? And if, if so, if you have uh, changed your CVA programming, how? The second one is what areas of evidence would you like to know more about with respect to CVA 
for protection outcomes? What, what, is, um, what are the fields within CVA for protection where you were uh, interested in, in finding out more on evidence? Do we have anyone, any of the 170 participants who um, would like to share their point of view? Or anyone who has, um, as I said uh, previously, another questions, uh, another question to uh, any of the part, uh, of the presenters or me, anyone from the task team, please feel free. I'm just gonna um, repeat the two questions that we had for you. Um, has the COVID-19 pandemic um, in a way forced you to adapt your CVA programming um, due to uh, uh, additional uh, GBV risks that you detected? And if so, what did you do? And the second one, um, what areas of evidence would you like to see uh, or more about and know more about in terms of CVA for protection? Hello, Stefan, can you yes. hear me? Loud and clear, yes. Yes, hi, um, I'm Nadia. I'm the protection cluster uh, co-facilitator in Mali. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about the HPC cycle. Last year, we had the section on cash and protection, but as here, uh, we didn't have many organizations who are using it. Uh, I was wondering this year, is it something that we should push um, or sensitize more organization, protection organization to try to integrate um, into the project so we can have it into um, the HPC cycles or, or not? And if yes, what is the best way to, to integrate it? Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. That, that's very interesting. Um, personally, I don't, um, I'm not, not so uh, familiar with that process. If anyone um, is on the line, then please um, share your point of view. Hello. Hi, Stefan. Hi. Uh, sorry, just uh, trying to provide some clarification for Nadia question. Uh, so I, for this year, there is also a guideline on incorporating uh, CVA in the mm -hmm. uh, HPC, uh, which gives some advice and uh, tip sheet on how to the way for a while to do so. And uh, I guess the uh, OCHA had undertaken an internal process to check uh, in terms of how CV is integrated uh, in this process, as well it's a linkage to uh, other sector or outcome protection, uh, which was a critical uh, uh, you see for last uh, year at uh, PC cycle where the protection link, uh, C linking, uh, CVA uh, and protection is uh, was not well addressed. And I think uh, from this guideline, uh, Nadia, you may have a lot of uh, advice and guidance 
uh, on using it. And uh, last week there was a webinar during the Geneva Cash Working Group where this discussion, uh, there is a discussion on this topic. And I guess you can find the recording uh, of this meeting via the CALP website to get more information and a uh, resource on that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I will try to find the um, documentation with Ocha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny. Um, as we're now approaching the end, I would like to draw your attention to a few uh, resources and contacts which are here on uh, the, uh, one of the last slides. So uh, the first is the um, cash for protection uh, stock taking paper uh, and available in many, many languages. Um, then there is the, um, uh, the website uh, for gbvaor.net, uh, the thematic areas, uh, cash and budget assistance. Um, we have resources on, on the CALP network, um, the resources of the uh, Global Women Institute. Um, then here, there are also the contacts uh, for the Cash for Protection uh, Task Team Leads. Uh, so that is uh, Tenzin, um, myself, uh, but also uh, for this event, um, Joanna and um, that last email address. But just don't know who that belongs to. And um, uh, lately, the, uh, lastly, the, the, uh, all the other presenters. Um, we would also like to, um, to draw your attention to the link that I just shared in the chat, which um, is the evaluation of this um, session, of this webinar, if you um, would, would be so kind to give us uh, your feedback. And um, in closing, I would um, also like to uh, point out to you that uh, on, on Wednesday, um, yeah, on Wednesday, the, the, uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, we will host this same um, webinar again in French. Um, I'm just gonna, that is uh, again at, um, not again, that is at two o'clock uh, in, Oh, it's two o'clock in Geneva time. Um, lastly, I would like to point out that uh, the stock taking paper will be up updated annually to reflect the current state of evidence across all AORs. And we will also be working with donors and implementing agencies to, uh, across all AORs to make use of the findings that we presented. Um, there's another initiative of the task team um, which is working on mapping for CVA for uh, mine action, which we're planning to um, finalize by the end of this year. Um, and very lastly, we will, um, as, as we said in the beginning, this uh, was a, re a recorded set, uh, webinar, so we will also provide the um, recording in the end on the um, GPC's website. So thank you so much uh, to everyone um, who participated. Uh, to, thank you so much um, uh, to Jennifer and uh, to Barbara uh, and to all the, um, all the colleagues who uh, presented their field studies. Uh, thank you to uh, Christine and to Joanna. And um, I hope um, that uh, we could kept, uh, keep the promise from the beginning uh, which was that you would leave this webinar uh, with new and useful information for your work. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>